You're listening to the Dental Zone podcast. I'm Dr. Rachel Hall. This is the place that supports you to understand your dental issues, the causes and how to prevent them, empowering each individual to get the most out of life while bearing a stunning smile. Hello and welcome to The Dental Zone. I'm Dr. Rachel Hall, holistic dentist from Brisbane, Australia. Thank you so much for joining me. This is episode 56, I believe, and we're in our series of how to improve your oral and overall health. So far, we've talked about tooth decay, gum disease, what causes it, how to prevent it, how to treat it. We've talked about doing a self-exam of your mouth so you know what to look for, what looks healthy and what is not healthy, and the tips and tools of your trade for how you can have great oral hygiene at home. And in today's episode, I'm going to share with you how to use those tools, what your oral hygiene regime should be like so that you can treat your gum disease you can improve the health and condition of your mouth, and then you can maintain that. If you'd like to know more about holistic dentistry and the oral systemic health link, you can hop on over to holisticdentistry.au and also check out my dental practice website, evolvedental.com.au. But for now, let's get in the zone. So let's have a look at your personal home care hygiene program. We've been over a lot of stuff together. If you've been listening to the episodes, you'll now understand the causes of tooth decay and gum disease. You'll know how to check out your mouth to look for what's healthy and what's not. And you know what tools and instruments you need to be able to fight these diseases and look after your mouth. Now you've got all that knowledge, but you've got to put it into action. Otherwise it's not going to be of any benefit to you. It's not going to make any changes to what's going on in your mouth or the health of your gums and your teeth. So you've got to integrate what you learn from outside sources that includes my episodes and any other things that you're reading, listening to or watching. But you've got to put that together with the instructions and the guidance that your hygienist or your dentist provide. And then you're going to have an oral hygiene program that is customized to your mouth. You've got to understand that no matter how well your hygiene program is designed, you've got to be willing to put all the parts together for a full preventive program. So it's no good you brushing and flossing and doing all the things you need to do if you're still eating lots of sugar and you've got a poor diet, for example, and then you're just feeding the bacteria that breed within your mouth that cause tooth decay and gum disease. You've got to have your existing tooth decay and gum disease treated and repaired. You've got to first get rid of the disease before you can prevent its return. I see and hear too many people going, oh, I got told I've got gum disease. I've got told I've got deep pockets. I've got told I need a deep clean. Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to swoosh with coconut oil and that's going to fix it all. No, you're putting a Band-Aid over an infection. The infection and the disease needs to be treated and rectified. And then in conjunction with that, you do what you need to do to make things heal and prevent yourself having further problems. So as much as you can do, you need to change your diet from a disease promoting one to a disease preventing one. You've got to resolve and commit to brushing, irrigating, flossing, cleaning in between your teeth and performing a combination of these activities immediately after eating any refined or processed foods. Periodically, say once a month, do a self-exam of your mouth and follow the hygiene recall schedule established by your dentist and hygienist. So we say to you, we advise that you come back every three months for hygiene care. We're not doing that just to make money. We're doing that because we know that that's what's needed to support you to have a healthy mouth. So let's talk about brushing. Let's begin with that because it's the most basic oral hygiene home care thing that you can do. And the reason that we brush is twofold. One, it's to get rid 
Um, it's to clear your mouth and rid your mouth of all the food and plaque. And two, it massages the gums. But I know so many of you don't brush your gums. You just clean your teeth. You need to brush your gums as well to remove the plaque and food from in and around the gum area, from under the little crevice, the gutter between the gum and the tooth, and to stimulate the gums by massaging them. When we massage a tissue, it brings in blood supply and nutrients and oxygen to that area, and it helps flush toxins. So when do you brush? Well, any time is a good time to brush, but there are some times that you're going to find are better and more advantageous than others. So the most important times to brush are after eating and also in the morning. I want you to brush after eating, especially if the meal or snack contain processed food and refined sugar. What I want you to do is brush as soon as possible after you eat. Um, no longer than four or five hours if you can. Preferably within half an hour would be great. The damage caused by food left in your mouth is directly proportional to how long it's left there. So the longer you leave that food there, the more at risk you are of having damage from it. Brushing in the morning is vital, even if you don't eat breakfast. You need to break up the plaque and the bacterial layers that have formed during the night while you were sleeping. It forms more rapidly during sleep than during waking hours because it doesn't require food to attach its gooey self to your teeth and because most of your body's natural plaque fighters, your tongue, lips and saliva are not nearly so active at night. So those bacteria while you sleep are just being left to their own means and devices. Even if your bedtime brushing removes all available food that the bacteria would eat off, the remaining plaque forming bacteria will continue to do their things. So brushing in the morning is crucial even if you don't eat. If you do eat breakfast, you can accomplish two goals with a single brushing by brushing after you eat. Otherwise, brush as soon as possible. Finally, it's a good idea to brush before going to bed, even if you've brushed after your last meal, just to break up any plaque that has formed since that previous brushing. Even if you've skipped meals or fasting, never let more than eight hours go by without putting a brush in your mouth and cleaning your teeth and gums. If you have advanced periodontitis, your dentist and your hygienist are going to want you to maybe brush more often. So for most people, we would say brush twice a day, brush in the morning and brush before you go to bed. That's gonna be okay if you've got a healthy mouth, a great diet and good balance of bacteria. But for most people, it's not enough. So this is where I advocate you brush when you wake up on the morning, you brush after you eat, and you brush before bed. So I would be saying breakfast, lunch, dinner, there's three times you should brush your teeth. If you have a snack mid-morning, a snack in the afternoon, you probably want to go to do another brush, particularly if you've been struggling with high rates of tooth decay and gum disease. If you're one of those people who goes to the dentist and every six months your gums are still bleeding, you've still got gum disease, then your oral hygiene regime is not working. If you're getting regular cavities, your oral hygiene regime is not working. Something needs to change. And those some things are very easy to change. So brush more frequently would be number one. How are you going to hold your brush? Well, there's no one way. The best way is the way that works for you. Just make sure you get the job done. Um, you're going to have to shift the position of your thumb and fingers as you have to adjust to get to different parts of your mouth and cover surfaces of the teeth and gums. Change your grip. It's easier than trying to rotate your arm or your wrist. If you experiment, you'll see what I mean. You can show your dentist and your hygienist your brushing technique, and we can then give you some tips on how to do that differently. Toothpaste, you want to put on 
enough toothpaste to cover about a third of the toothbrush, um, run body temperature water over the brush and paste for a few seconds to equalise the temperatures of the brush and paste and your teeth. Um, get into the habit of doing this if you have bone loss or teeth that are sensitive to cold. Um, that way you're going to enjoy brushing, it's not going to hurt your teeth and you're going to do it more effectively. It really helps as well that if before you begin brushing, you rinse your mouth and gargle with some water because this again makes brushing more effective. You can put a little bit of bicarb and 3% hydrogen peroxide in that water as well because they're um, alkalizing and they're antibacterial and then you brush your teeth and then you can then swoosh around with the baking soda and the hydrogen peroxide once again to finish. How much time should you spend brushing your teeth? Well, everyone says it's two minutes. Most people don't brush for that long. 20 or 30 seconds tops, that is not long enough to break up all the plaque bacteria and to get into every area effectively. The only way to find out how much time you need to spend on your hygiene program is actually to, is to follow the guidelines that I'm recommending and those of your hygienist. Don't be concerned if someone else needs to do less or more than you. It's got to be tailored to your situation. You're not worried about saving anybody else's teeth, just yours, so you just focus on you. It's what's important is not how much time you have to spend saving your teeth, but how much time you save by taking care of them. It takes much more time for you to keep coming to the dental office and have your disease treated than it will ever take to prevent it. The amount of time you put in to keep each area of your mouth healthy is determined by how much disease you have now or you've had in the past. For example, an area that's in its early stages of gingivitis, that's gum disease, will require less time and attention than an area with advanced periodontitis, which is where you've got severe gum recession, pocketing and bone loss. As you will discover, certain areas are going to be more susceptible to decay and gum disease than others, and these will always require more care. The results of your hygiene efforts will determine your total time expenditure. If you start out spending four minutes a day and are unable to maintain healthy teeth and gums, you'll have to increase your time to maybe six, seven or more. On the other hand, if you've been spending 10 minutes a day and each checkup proves that your mouth is in great shape, you might be able to reduce your time down a bit until you reach a happy balance. There's really no more, no need to spend more time on dental care than you need. So if a three minute brush in the morning, lunchtime and evening is working for you, then you don't need to change that. What about your brushing pattern? Well, most people are really all over the place, it's ha haphazard, it's hit and miss, um, and they don't have a pattern or a technique. Usually the brushing process starts at the front, front teeth and ends up somewhere near the back. There seems to be no kind of logic to the way people brush, and in most cases the front teeth get all the attention. When the areas that need the most work, which are the harder to reach ones, the harder to keep clean ones at the back, are often miss altogether. I bet you can't tell me how you brushed the last time you brushed, where you began and where you ended. Well, this is why you've got to establish a pattern. It's one of the little known but very important parts of a good oral hygiene program. You've got to be present and focused while you're cleaning your mouth. When you're cleaning your house, do you just run around across the room from one place to another, from one room to another, randomly just running around? No, you're methodical. You have a pattern and a way that you approach it. Well, most people do anyway. Um, so let's establish a pattern. Let's work out how you're going to do this. Well, first of all, you've got to take the advice from your hygienist or your dentist they're going to tell you which areas need the most work and how well you're doing. Then, based on your self-examination, you can see where needs more attention. And the third is if you do have periodontitis, 
get a copy of your pocket depth chart from your dentist. This gives you a roadmap that detects you and takes you and directs you to the problem areas. So if you've got a pocket that's a six on the top right at the back, you've got to spend more time looking after that than an area at the front that's healthy and only has a pocket of two, which is normal. Where to brush? Everyone knows you should brush your teeth, but brushing your teeth is only half the battle. As I said earlier, your gums need to be brushed as much as your teeth do. Even though plaque forms only on the teeth, the gums need the stimulation that brushing, flossing and water irrigation provide. This massaging action stimulates blood circulation and it toughens the gums up in the same way that you get a callus on your hands and feet to protect them. So when you think teeth, think gums too. I want you to clean your teeth and gums. Every part of every tooth must be brushed, especially the part where the gum joins the tooth, the gingival sulcus, and then the gums down to about... Um, a, a half to a centimeter below the gum line. Think of the area to be brushed consisting of four parts. Now those four parts are the inside surfaces of the teeth and gums, so the bits on the roof in your mouth and your tongue side, the outside surfaces of the teeth and gums, so that's the lip and cheek side, the back side of the last teeth and gums, you've got to get all the way down the the back, and then the chewing surfaces, the biting surfaces of all the teeth. So I want you to pick one side of your mouth to begin brushing, then always start from that point. Let's start with the upper, upper right if you're right-handed, upper left if you're left-handed. If this starting point is new to you, your movements are going to feel a bit awkward and a bit uncoordinated at first. Don't get frustrated, hang on in there. Establish a set starting and finishing point. This has nothing to do with your brushing technique, but it does guarantee that you're gonna cover all the bases and every single bit, every single time. It's very important that you follow the sequence because it will ensure that you first brush the areas that normally get the least attention. The insides of your teeth and gums and the outsides of the back teeth are where the highest incidence of gum disease occur. You don't want to spend time on the less vulnerable areas and then run out of steam, run out of enthusiasm, or run out of time because you get before you get to those problem areas. If you need a reminder, put a little note on your mirror. So here we go. As I talk, hope you're not in public, but you might want to pretend that your index finger, your pointer finger, is your toothbrush and go through the motions as you're listening to me. So we're going to do the inside surfaces. So start with the last tooth on the upper right on the inside and move around the insides of the upper teeth to the last tooth on the upper left. So you're going to start back right on the inside and move all the way around to the back left on the inside. And then you want to get around and up the back edge of the last tooth on both sides. Now we're gonna do the outer surfaces. We're gonna start on the last tooth on the upper right and we're gonna go all along the outer sides all the way along to the last tooth on the left and then drop down to the outside of the last tooth on the lower and go around and we're going to go left to right. So I'm going to just go over that again because I don't think I made it very clear for doing the insides. So you start on the inside, upper right, move all the way along to the upper left, then down to the inside of the lower left and back around to the lower right. So we're going in a circle. Then we do the same on the outside, upper right to upper left, drop down to the lower, lower left to lower right, and then we've completed the circle. Then we're going to do the back surfaces of the last teeth. Begin with the back of the last upper right, move to the upper left, down to the lower left, and finally the lower right. I think you get the picture. 
always start and end on the same side. And if you space out somewhere in between, you kind of know where you've been and where you're going, okay? Then we do the chewing surfaces. Finally, you get to brush the chewings, the biting surfaces. So we're gonna begin on the top right last tooth, brush all the chewing surfaces all the way around to the left. Then gravity is gonna take you down to the lower left. You're gonna do the tops of your bottom teeth and all the way around your jaw to the last tooth on the right. Do the tops last. Do the other harder to reach areas first before you run out of energy or get bored or think, oh, that'll do. The number of times you repeat the pattern will vary depending on the condition of your gums and your teeth. So it might end up being four times that you go around the lap or it might be 10 times. Now let's look at how to brush. Now you know why, where, when and how much time to spend. You need to make sure the four parts of your mouth are brushed in a slightly different way. So you're gonna be doing this in front of your mirror have your hygienist and your dentist watch you as you improve your technique and then we can help you fine tune that. Remember, there's going to be different ways to do it for each area. So on the inside surfaces of the back teeth and gums, hold the brush firmly against the gums at about a 45 degree angle. Then move the brush from the gums to your teeth. As you do this, you keep the pressure against the teeth and gums and you kind of rotate your wrist until your brush meets the point where the gum meets the teeth on the gum line. So you're kind of rolling the brush up and down from the gum to the tooth and back again. Once there, gently direct the bristles into the groove or the gingival crevice when the brush meets between the teeth and the gum and continue to exert gentle but firm pressure and vibrate the bristles in a small circular motion. This will also force the bristles into the spaces between the teeth. The gingival crevice, that little gum gutter, is the most crucial area. Pause here and make sure that you spend extra time to clean and massage the area thoroughly. When you've taken care of the crevice, continue across the rest of the tooth surface, increasing the pressure of the brush. With an average size brush, the bristles will effectively cover about two teeth and the gums around them. As you move the brush to each new position, overlap the last area you brushed to make sure you avoid missing anything. Never brush the teeth from side to side. Over time, brushing side to, side to side will separate the gum from the tooth and eventually wear a groove in the area of the root that is normally protective by the gum. We call that toothbrush abrasion. Because the inside surfaces of your teeth are usually not given as much attention as the outside, be sure to spend extra time brushing them. Chances are good that if you check the condition of your gums around the inside of the back teeth, you will find that they show signs of disease. Now to do the inside surfaces of the front teeth and gums, um, they're actually quite a difficult area to reach with the brush because of the curve of the front teeth can make it nearly impossible to use the same set technique that you're going to use on the rest of your teeth. So if you've got small dental arches you, and your toothbrush is too large, you're going to make it really, really hard to clean those areas. So you've got to make sure that after you've done the back teeth and you've reached kind of about the three quarter point mark, in order to reach the inside of the front teeth, you're gonna to have to change the position of the brush. So what you're gonna to need to do is angle the brush so that the tip of it is facing the back of your throat. So you're holding it at 90 degrees to your mouth. Use the bristles that are closest to your hand to brush this area, both the upper and the lower. If you have trouble keeping these areas clean and healthy, you might have to switch to a really small or a child's size brush. Now let's do the outside surfaces of all the teeth. Use the same position and technique as you did with the inside. Your brush should be able to cover two teeth at once, but the key to the success of any brushing technique is not only how you brush, but how much 
time you spend in each area. So I might say to you, your gums on the lower right, tongue side at the back are not as healthy as everywhere else. I want you to spend more time there. That's pretty clear that that's where you need to spend more time. So you may have, you may be one of those people who has trouble reaching the outsides of your last two teeth on both sides when your mouth is wide open. Well, the reason that this happens is because as you open, the jaw joint and the lower jaw slides forwards and it pushes your brush out of the way when you open your mouth too far, especially if you have a small mouth and you use a big brush. To solve this problem, put the brush in your mouth and lay the brush flat against your upper back teeth in the position in which you would begin your brushing. Then close your mouth until your teeth are about a centimeter apart. Don't bite the brush. You will now find you have much more access to clean that once to hard to reach area. Try it, you'll see what I mean. It's what I ask patients to do when I'm doing their hygiene treatments. When I'm up the back, I get them to close slightly, about halfway, so I've got more room and the cheek is relaxed and the jaw joint is pushed back so I can get into that area. So that's a little tip for you. Then you're gonna do the back surfaces of the last teeth. Place the brush right up onto your biting surface and angling it down slightly. And then you're gonna move it from left to right. So from inside to outside, inside to outside, across that area um, to get the back edge of that tooth clean. The, the the size of the brush makes this movement a little awkward and you're going to need to move the brush around to clean both the tooth and the gum. There are little brushes called tufties or tuft, tuft brushes that are angled at 90 degrees that are specifically designed for getting into those areas. You might need to use one of those. As when you brush any area of your mouth, you're going to need some trial and error to get the best approach. The backs of the last teeth are one of the most overlooked areas, so don't forget to hit these spots with both your brush and your floss. Then you're going to clean your chewing surfaces. The grooves and fissures and folds in the back teeth run in all directions. If you're going to clean these grooves, you're going to need to move the brush in all directions um, to get into them. It's not always possible to completely clean these grooves, but a firm back and forth shimmy, like a little dance step, is going to clean them quite efficiently. Even if all the chewing surfaces have been restored with fillings, it's important to brush them because these fillings will break down or wear away where they meet the tooth. And these margins, these join lines, are the perfect breeding grounds for bacteria and ideal, ideal place for plaque formation. Likewise, if you've got full crowns on your back teeth, you should still brush the chewing surfaces because plaque can form in the grooves and margins. Now, it's not going to cause decay because you can't decay a crown, but you don't want plaque. You don't want to have the germ population um, breeding inside there. So there's talk about dry brushing, and there have been promotions of this. There's a philosophy that dry bristles are more effective at dislodging plaque because neither toothpaste nor water become, you know, in between them. To dry brush, you don't have to change your brushing pattern or technique. The only thing you do differently is you don't add paste or water, and then you frequently wipe your saliva from the bristles with a cloth or tissue. Um, I don't think there's much different. I actually um, prefer paste. I don't like dry brushing, it makes me gag. Um, sorry, that's just me, uh, but it's up to you. You can do any way you want. I just want you to be brushing. I don't recommend um, dry brushing though if it's been a while since, you know, 12 hours or more since you've brushed, you're gonna need to get in with some paste. You need that abrasion activity to help dislodge the plaque. At night, I suggest you first apply your toothpaste to the brush and then just go around a few cycles, clean off and polish the teeth, and then you don't need to add more toothpaste unless you really want to. Um, 
it's, it's up to you how you do it. Which technique should you use? There are many brushing techniques besides the ones I've suggested, and they're all variations on the theme. Um, they're all going to require you to be methodical and take your time. Um, my brush brushing technique is not the only one that's going to work for you but it's one that i find is very effective it's easy to do and easy to follow but if your hygienist your hygienist feels you need to modify anything then please do so because they're the one who's looking at your mouth they're the one who can explain it to you and show you what to do and help you adjust your technique to get the results that you need now if you've had bone loss the brush alone is not going to be enough to keep your gums healthy. You're going to need floss, water irrigation, mouthwashes, special interdental brushes. The function of the toothbrush is unlike that of the other preventive tools like floss and irrigation. Floss's function is unique and it can't do what water irrigation does. You're going to have to use different tools for the jobs. You know, you're going to need more than just a hammer and a nail. You're going to need a, a wrench and a socket set to, to build a house. You're going to need something to floss and clean in between your teeth with as well. So with your brushing, be methodical, take your time, work every area, start at the back, start on the insides, work your way around, and then you're going to make sure you cover every single area. So let's move on to floss. I think this is also going to be quite a long podcast. I may break this one up a little bit for you. I know I said that last time and I didn't, but I think with this one I will. So I'm going to make this one about toothbrushing and flossing and then we'll pause there um, and then you can practice that for a week before we start adding in other things. Step by step, guys. If you've never had gum disease, if you have perfect dental health, you've never had fillings, um, if you have had fillings that are all perfectly shaped, perfectly smooth, there's no bad contacts, and you have a healthy diet, and you understand all the hows, whys, and whens of oral hygiene, and you're really faithful to your oral hygiene program, you actually may never need to floss. Um, but only a very, very small percent of the population fall into this category. So if you're hearing this, don't think that it's you. Don't think, oh, Dr. Rachel said, I don't need to floss. I have really great teeth. I've only ever had, you know, um, orthodontic work and not much else, but I still floss. Guys, I hate flossing. I will admit it. I find it fiddly and awkward, so I get it. I understand. But I will floss just to go in between the contacts of my teeth, and then I make sure that I'm using uh, interdental brushes as well. Anyway, flossing, why do we do it? Well, it removes food, it breaks up plaque formation, it cleans the teeth, and it massages the gums, but it only does so in the areas the floss can reach. For example, you can't floss the insides and the outsides of your teeth. You can only really floss in between them. Um, you can clean from the top of the tooth all the way down to the gums and the areas that the floss reaches effectively, you're going to be doing a great job. All other parts of the teeth and gums, they belong to the brush and the water irrigation. So you, ne you need to do both. You can't just do one or the other. You can floss anytime, but if you are brushing and flossing, I recommend you floss after you brush. Um, how to floss? It's more difficult for me to explain it um, than it is for somebody to show it to you. There's about 20 different descriptions on how to do it. They all describe the same procedure. Learning how to floss correctly is no more difficult than learning to do it the wrong way, but only the correct method's going to get results. It's going to feel a bit difficult and awkward at start, but if you think your teeth are worth saving and your health is worth um, you know, not having gum disease and all the impacts and ramifications that that has on your overall health and well-being, then it's definitely worth doing it. There's some studies that say people who floss will live healthier and longer lives. Um, life expectancy of those who do floss is about seven years greater than those who don't. So whether you're left or right-handed, you're going to need to make some adjustments, uh, and I'll go through it as best I can on a podcast. Um, I would do a video, but who really gross? Uh, 
Who wants to watch somebody flossing their teeth? Anyway, you want to start flossing on the same side. We're going to go upper right, and then we're going to work our way to upper left, and then back round in the lower jaw. We're going to keep doing that circle. Finish and start on the side where you started. You're going to need about um, 30 centimeters, maybe 40 centimeters of floss. If you're American, that's about 18 inches. Um, you might need a little bit less or more. You can always get more out. You're going to wrap the floss three or four times around the middle finger of your right hand um, at the closest joint to your nail. And then you're going to do the same for the middle finger of your left hand. You're going to adjust the floss so that there's about between two to four centimeters of floss between your two fingers. You don't want a big skipping rope and you don't want the floss too short. So when you're flossing, you're going to need one position for the right side and a little bit of a variation for the left. So when you're doing on the upper right, you want to move the floss over to the soft part of your right thumb and hold the index finger against it to hold the floss in place. So like you're just touching the tips of your index finger and your thumb together and you've got the floss in between it and the floss is still round, wrapped around your middle finger. So you've got those two pads together. Then with the other hand, you place the floss over the pad of your left index finger. You slowly move your hands apart until the floss is stretched nice and tight and you place the index finger of your left hand in your mouth Flossing is only going to work if you keep your right finger and thumb outside the teeth. In order to practice, try this technique on your front teeth where it's easiest. And then when you feel confident, start with the last tooth on your upper right. You can use this position as far as kind of the premolars, the cuspids on the left side. So that's about three quarters of the upper arch. You know, so you've done all the top right, you've done the front, and then you're about three quarters of the way round onto the left side. Um, and you can use this technique. It's easier to move your lips out of the way if you open your jaw only as wide as you need, because then they're nice and relaxed. Then to get to the left side, do everything the same, but you're going to reverse it. So now that your left hand is going to be holding the floss between your index finger and your thumb, and your right hand's going to have the floss over the pad. And then that way, your right index finger is now inside your mouth and your left hand is outside. And you can do that to reach the last kind of six or so teeth on the upper left. Again, try this position before in between the front teeth. Just have a little practice. And you let out a little bit more floss between your finger and thumb to reach the last teeth. And then when you floss the lower jaw, you can do the same. Once you do it, we're going to teach you the little technique because it's a slightly different angle. You wrap the floss around your middle fingers as you did when you do the upper, but you place the floss over the soft part of your right index finger. Pinch the loose end between your left thumb and index finger and pull it tight. Leave again about two to two and a half, three centimeters of floss between your hands. Then starting from the lower left, insert the finger held floss into your mouth um, from the lower left to the lower right. So you're kind of pointing it downwards with your finger and you're holding the floss um, against the knuckle part of your finger very hard to talk about on a podcast guys so I do apologize you're probably sitting there super confused um, I may just make a little video showing you how to hold the floss so look out for that on on YouTube when you floss the back, backs of your teeth in a normal mouth there are four teeth with exposed backs that's two on the upper and two on the lower. And most people were never told to floss these areas, but they need to be flossed. It's really quite easy to do. Hold the floss between your thumb and index finger of both hands. Allow about 
four centimeters of floss between your hands. Adjust your fingers so you can loop the floss around the back tooth. Each of the four teeth will require slightly different finger in position. Uh, I'm gonna leave it up to you to find the best way that works. If you've lost any teeth, then you'll need to floss the two sides adjacent to the void. So you're kind of almost lassoing and hooking the floss over the ends of those back teeth. Well, what flossing movement should you use? Well, they should all be flossed the same way. So I'm gonna describe flossing between only two teeth. Practice these movements from between the bottom front teeth. That way you can see in the bathroom mirror if you're doing correctly. Guide the floss to the space between the two front teeth. Pull it to one side, so you're pulling it against one of the teeth, and slide it down the side of that tooth. At the same time you pull the floss down, use a back and forth shimmy movement, a little bit like towel drying your back. So you're pulling the floss slightly from one side to the other. This movement helps to flatten the floss against um, the tooth and allows you to slide it um, by a tight contact more easily than if you try to force the floss straight down. This downward shimmy movement also allows you to use less force and not all contact points are the same. If you try and force the floss through a tight contact with a lot of pressure, you can break the floss or snap it through the contact point, hitting the gums with a great deal of force. And this can break the skin of the gums and cause bleeding, especially if you've got infective gums. Once you've passed the contact point, you're in what is called the triangle area between the teeth. The contact point is one point of the triangle and each tooth is one side of the triangle and the gum between the teeth constitutes the third side. Every side of the triangle needs to be flossed. So when you're cleaning the teeth with the floss, pull the floss against one side of the tooth and slide it up the tooth until it hits the contact point. Wrap the floss around the tooth as far as you can. The size of your mouth and fingers is gonna determine how much you can do that. And slide the floss down towards the gums and make sure it goes down as far as it can. This movement on the tooth is like shining the top of the shoe with the floss as the polishing rag. Be careful not to jam the floss into the gums because it can injure them and force plaque into the pocket. Move the floss up and down six to eight times and then do the same on the opposite tooth. So you don't slide it back out the gap. Don't get it past the contact. Just move the floss in the opposite direction to be against the side of the other tooth. Finish off each side with a few in and out movements. So you're going up and down, up and down, then back and forth, back and forth. Um, this in and out movement is especially important um, when you arrive at the junction of the tooth and gums because it carries the food particles and plaque out into the mouth rather than jamming it down in the gums. Now, after you've cleaned both sides of the triangle, you need to massage the gums between your teeth. Be careful if you've got gum disease because they may be very soft and fragile. Simply move the floss backwards and forward across the surface of the gums three or four times, exerting only slight pressure. This massages the gums, helps to toughen them and increases the blood flow internally. Increase the pressure as your gums become healthier, but never to the extent that you're gonna make your gums kind of shredded and bleeding. How you remove the floss is critical. Since the day floss was invented, probably tens of thousands of fillings have been pulled out by improper floss removal. Um, sometimes I use floss to pull out a temporary crown, you know, because it gets stuck. So if your filling is not done properly or protrudes beyond the tooth surface, floss that is pulled out through the contact point will only catch on the overhang, rip, fray, or get stuck. And if you use enough force, you can pull that filling out. And this is not fun. It's going to require a visit to the dentist and the cost of that. The trick is to never remove the floss by pulling it through the contact point if either tooth has a filling in the tooth. 
It's better to let go of one end of the floss inside your mouth and slide it out through the triangle slowly towards the outside. When you're proficient at flossing, you're going to be able to tightly hold the floss between the thumb and index finger inside your mouth instead of wrapping it around your middle finger. And then that way it's easier to pull the floss out through any problem areas. So when you floss, check for bleeding. Once a week, check the floss after you pull it, after you pull it out. If there is bleeding, it will appear on the floss as a red, um, reddish pink color. Some flosses are colored red, so don't use them because you can't see what you're doing. If you, use, if you do see any sign of blood, note its location, not only because you need to let your hygienist know, but you are going to need to give that area more attention when you brush, floss, and irrigate. Wipe or rinse off the floss or use a new piece before going on to the next flossing area. You can use your floss to check whether the margin of a filling fits as well as it should. If the floss hangs up or frays, make a note, point it out to the dentist and your hygienist. Ask whether that margin can be um, smoothed or not. If the floss gets frayed, then you will need to use a new piece. Floss after you have brushed and spit out the excess paste, but before you have rinsed. Um, the paste remaining between your teeth will actually act as a good cleansing and polishing agent. Now I'm going to stop there. There are more things that we need to cover, but 45 minutes, your brain's going to be fried. Um, it's a lot of information to take in. And I think I'd like you to start really practicing those brushing techniques, um, taking your time, starting and finishing in the same spot, working your way around methodically, practicing your flossing techniques, going in through the contact, pulling the floss against the tooth, going up and down the sides of the teeth, and then making sure you're massaging your gums, both with your toothbrush and with your floss. So to summarize, brush in the morning, whether you've eaten or not, brush after you eat, brush before bed, take your time, that could be two minutes, it could be five minutes, it could be 10 minutes. Focus on your problem areas, take more time there. Be methodical, start on the upper right insides, go round to the top left, then come round insides, left to right on the bottom. Do that for the outsides and then do the backs of the end teeth and your chewing surfaces. Do the same when you're flossing. Practice, practice, practice. Don't get frustrated. Just keep going. You will get better as that um, muscle coordination improves and the eye-hand coordination and muscle memory. You're going to be one of the world's best brushers and flossers and you're going to help improve and heal your gum health and prevent tooth decay and gum disease and all the ramifications of those things. I'm sorry I've tried to teach you flossing on a podcast um, I'll have a go at making a video. If it's too gross, it'll get canned. But maybe I can just show you how to hold the floss and what those hand positions look like. Um, once I've done that, I'll let you know on the podcast channel and we'll share the link for you to hop on over to that. I'm Dr. Rachel Hall. This is the Dental Zone Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that this has opened your eyes on how to brush and floss and maybe given you some ahas about why you are still having gum disease and tooth decay. Uh, it may be that the missing link is in the way you're brushing, frequency of brushing, how long you're brushing and so forth. Um, thank you very much once again. Uh, if you want to know more, hop on over to holisticdentistry.au or you can always check out evolvedental.com.au. If you live in the Brisbane area or you're able to travel and you'd like me to be your dentist and you'd like to come for a dental check, consultation or treatment, amalgam removal, gum care, veneers, cosmetic work, orthodontics, whatever floats your boat, I'm here. Our number is 07372018111. And until next time, practice your tooth brushing and your flossing and get in the zone and stay in the zone. You've been listening to the Dental Zone Podcast with Dr. Rachel Hall. For health, lifestyle, fitness and a great smile, get in the zone.